Picture the sun's royal seat, an imposing building with towering columns, resplendent in glittering gold and blazing bronze, its pediment proudly surmounted by figures in burnished ivory, the double doors at the entrance a sheen of shimmering silver. More wonderful yet is the workmanship which Vulcan displayed on the portal's reliefs, the ocean encircling the central earth on a detailed map of the world with the sun's great canopy over it. There in the waves are the sea gods, Triton holding his conch horn, Proteus, who constantly changing his shape, and the giant Aegeon, gripping the monstrous backs of the whale with his hundred arms, Doris along with her daughters, some of them shown to be swimming, while others are resting upon the rocks and drying their green hair, or riding along on a fish. The nymphs have different features, but show the family likeness that might be expected in sisters. Embossed on earth are the men in their cities and beasts in their forests, the water nymphs next to their stream and the other rural divinities. Crowning these pictures, the heavens, brightly portrayed with the signs of the zodiac, six of the right-hand door and six on the left. Phaethon quickly mounted the steep approach to the palace and entered the house of the god whom he wished to be sure was his father, marching boldly towards the face of his sire, he halted a little way off, as it hurt his eyes to come any closer. Garbed in a robe of royal purple, radiant Phoebus was sitting there on a throne, which is glowing with brilliant emeralds. Standing close on his right and his left were the spirits of day, of month, and of year, the centuries and hours at their equal intervals. Also in waiting were youthful spring, with her wreath of flowers, summer naked but for her garland of ripening corn ears. Autumn stained with the juice of trodden clusters of grapes, an icy winter, whose aged locks were hoary and tangled. Then, from his place in the center, the sun, with his all-seeing eyes, caught sight of the young man trembling in all of his strange surroundings. "'Why have you come?' he inquired. "'And what do you seek in this stronghold? Phaethon, offspring of mine, whom his father could never disown. O Phoebus, my father!' Light that illuminates the infinite universe, answered the youth, if you will allow me to call you my father, if climbing is not trying to cloak some guilty secret, grant me a sign, my father, whereby all men must believe that I am truly your son, and banish this doubt from my own mind. Then in response his father removed the circlet of sparkling rays which adorned his head, commanded the youth to come nearer, and folded him close in his arms. You are truly mine, he assured him. Denial would do you injustice, and climbing did not deceive you. Away with your doubts. Now ask me, whatever favor you will, and I will bestow it. To witness my promise, I call on the Stygian marsh, which the gods must swear by, though I have never set eyes on it. Phaethon answered at once. He asked for his father's chariot, with leave to control the winged foot horses, for just one day. His father at once regretted his oath. Repeatedly shaking his lustrous head, he exclaimed, Your request has proved my promise too rash. How I wish I could break it, dear son, I confess to you freely. This is the only wish I could ever be moved to refuse you. Still, I can argue against it. Believe me, you are looking for danger. The favor you ask is great, my faith, and far too great for the strength you have. You are only a boy, too young to attempt it. Your destiny is mortal. Your wishes transcend your mortal limits. Indeed, your ignorant heart is pursuing what even immortals can never attain. We all may flatter ourselves as we will, yet none save I has the strength to withstand in the fiery chariot and hold his footing. Even the ruler of vast Olympus, who hurls the deadly thunderbolts forth from his awesome hand, shall never control this car. And what have we greater than Jove? The start of the journey is steep, though the horses are fresh in the morning. The climb is a mighty hall, the highest stretch is mid-heaven, where even I am often afraid to look down on the lands, and the sea below, and my heart is a flutter with quivering terror. The end is a downward path, and calls for impeccable steering. Then even Tethys, the goddess who welcomes me into the waves as I set, can tremble with fear that my fall will be over precipitous. Recognizing, too, that the sky spins round in a constant vortex, drawing the stars on high as they whirl in their swift revolutions, my impetus thrusts against it, unswayed by the forces which master all else, 
and in driving my steeds I oppose the sphere's swift motion. Suppose that I lend you my car. What then? Can you really encounter the poles without being swept away by their rapid rotation? Perhaps you imagine you'll find the groves of the gods up there, with their beautiful cities and sanctuaries richly laden with offerings. No, your path is beset with beasts that are lying in ambush. Even supposing you hold your courage and are not diverted, your journey will take you straight to the horns of the charging bull, straight to the centaur archer, and straight to the jaws of the raging lion, then on to the scorpion, whose menacing arms are bent in a long, wide sweep, and the crab with his claws of smaller range. Moreover, it's far from easy to govern those spirited horses, strong with the fire in their breasts which they breathe from their mouth and nostrils, and little inclined to obey even my firm hands. When their mettle is hotly aroused, and their necks are resisting the pull of the reins, oh, listen, my son, don't force me to make you a gift that can only prove fatal. Be warned and amend your prayer before it's too late. I can understand that you need some indisputable proof that my own blood runs in your veins. So here you have it. My fatherly fears and misgivings prove me to be your father. Look, boy, look at my face, how I wish your eyes were able to pierce deep down to my heart and catch a glimpse of your father's anxiety. Finally, look all around you, Survey whatever the wealthy cosmos contains, and make your choice of the bountiful riches of the earth and sea and sky. Be sure I'll refuse you nothing. This one thing only I beg you not to demand. It's a sentence, not honor, you're asking for. Punishment, faith, and never a present. Why are your fingers caressing my neck, you ignorant boy? Never fear. I have sworn by the Stygian marsh, and I'll surely give you whatever you choose to ask for. But choose more wisely, I beg you. His warnings were finished, but Phaethon still resisted the sun gods, pleased and pressed his request in his burning desire for the chariot. And so, delaying as long as he could, his father conducted the young man down to the lofty conveyance which Vulcan had made him. The axle and pole were constructed of gold, and golden too was the rim encircling the wheels, which were fitted with spokes of silver, chrysolites, jewels arranged in a pattern along the yoke reflected their brilliant splendor on shining phoebus himself and while self-confident phaethon studied the car in amazement at such fine workmanship dawn was awake to open her purple gates in the glimmering east and bathe her forecourt in roseate glory the stars were routed and lucifer brought up the rear as last of all he abandoned his watch in the brightening sky when Titan saw that the morning star was inclined earthward, the sky growing pink and the horns of the waning moon disappearing, he gave the command to the fleet-footed hours to harness his steeds. The goddesses quickly performed his bidding. Forth from the lofty stables they set the fire-breathing stallions, fully refreshed with ambrosia juice, and carefully fastened the jingling bridles. Next the father anointed the face of his son with a holy balsam, to offer protection against the scorching flames, and placed his radiant crown on the young man's head. Then, heaving, sighs from his troubled heart and gloomy foreboding, he said, If you are still able to take one piece of advice from your father, spare the goad, my son, and put more strength in the reins. My horses will speed unencouraged. The task is to curb their impatience. Don't follow a route directly across the sky's five zones. The path is cut at a slanting angle and runs in a wide arc, well inside the three middle zones, and carefully avoiding the southern pole and the zone to the north with its biting winds. You must keep to that road. The ruts of my wheels will be clearly visible. Then, to give the earth and sky an equal share of your warmth, don't drive the chariot down or scale the top of the ether. Venture to climb too high, and you'll be burning the ceiling of heaven, the earth if you sink too low. For safety, remain in the middle. Swerving too far to the right, you'll be caught in the coils of the serpent. Too far to the left, you'll collide with the altar, near the horizon. Hold to a course between. The rest I resign to fortune. I pray her to help and take care of you better than you take care of yourself. As I speak, the dewy night has reached its appointed goal on the shores of the west. The time for delay is over, the summons has come, for the darkness has fled and aurora is glowing. Now grasp the reins in your hand, or if your ambitious purpose can yet be altered, take my advice and not my chariot. 
Allow me to give my light to the earth, and watch me in safety, while still you can, while still you are standing on solid earth, before you have blindly mounted the car you so foolishly asked for.